How's it going guys? Today we're going to look at the dark side of video games and corporate. It's a story about corporate manipulation, blatant lying, and corporate silencing. It's a story about corporations doing everything they can to make sure employees and contractors don't show their actual behaviors. It's a story about, hey, take some money even though we ruined your reputation, and we'll call it Square. So stick around, buckle up, you're in for a good one. So let me give you the TLDR. Now this story is somewhat recent. You might have heard of it. It's Bethesda, now Microsoft, versus Mick Gordon, their music composer. The music composer of Doom 2016 and its soundtrack, and Doom Eternal and its soundtrack. Those are all separate products, by the way. Now during the development of Doom Eternal and its soundtrack, there was some apparent corporate mismanagement and incompetence behind the scenes that caused the blatant failure and negative press that the Doom Eternal soundtrack received. After that, Mick Gordon and Marty Stratton were supposed to go and make a public statement together addressing the negative press and concerns about the Doom Eternal soundtrack. But in a move and a betrayal, the manager, Marty Stratton, went on Reddit to publish what's known as the open letter to the community of Doom, in which he pretty much just blames Mick Gordon for his incompetence, thus ruining and tarnishing his reputation and severely damaging his ability to do future work. Now, before we begin, I'd just like to thank Mick for the absolute banger riffs, BFG Division. Rip and tear, Oh boy, I've never had as many PRs in the gym than with those songs in the background. I'm serious, put BFG Division on and tell me you don't feel like you can lift a bus with your bare hands. So here's the summary. Mick Gordon is working on the in-game music for Doom Eternal. There are a bunch of issues with scheduling and the ability to get assets over to Mick Gordon while he's working on the music for the game. And in the middle of all of that, id software announces a separate soundtrack for the game with mick gordon's name on it but without a contract for him to work on it and without even telling him that they announced a doom eternal soundtrack a release date is given for the soundtrack but there's no way for mick gordon to start working on it mick gordon starts asking id software employee marty stratton for a contract so he can start working on it but is ignored months go by without a response mick just barely finishes working on the in-game music and still has no contract to make the soundtrack that was set to release with the game. The deadline is quickly approaching and as time dwindles, everyone can see what this means for Mick Gordon. The less time he has to work on it, the less songs he can most likely make for it. So what does Mick Gordon do? He goes above id Software and Marty Stratton to their publisher to Bethesda. Months have gone by without Mick being able to work on a product that has his name on it and a set release date. So just 29 days before the soundtrack was set to come out, Bethesda says, no problem, here's a contract, make 12 songs for us. And the deadline is April 16th. If that doesn't work, then it can be flexible. But then on April 3rd of 2020, 13 days before the soundtrack was due, Mick Gordon received an email from Marty Stratton. <laughs> the original April 16th date was no longer flexible. It was an absolute necessity. Marty said that they were being mindful of consumer protection laws in some territories, which meant anyone who purchased the collector's edition of Doom Eternal and didn't get the soundtrack when it released meant that they would be entitled to a full refund if they didn't get it by April 20th, 2020. As they hit April, Marty grew increasingly concerned about Mick's ability to deliver the soundtrack. Marty Stratton personally asked the lead audio designer, as I mentioned in the beginning, Chad Mossholder, to start beginning work on their versions of soundtracks if Mick couldn't deliver the soundtrack on time. Now, when Marty told Mick Gordon that we're not sure you're going to be able to make the deadline, we started working on our own things, Mick responded by saying, oh, I expressed regret at the situation and we shouldn't work against each other. Uh, we shouldn't have you making a separate soundtrack while I also try to make a separate one and whoever can make the deadline makes it. We should work together. Mick Gordon was curious what Chad was working on, what he was mixing with the in-game music to make new songs. That's a little sus. So Mick Gordon asked Chad to send over all of the songs that Chad had been working on. Now we have to note that Marty told Mick Gordon that they just started working on these songs. But when Chad sent his music over to Mick, he sent 70 songs. But Mick Gordon thought, wait a minute, how long have they actually been working on this behind the scenes? Because I was told that they just started and this is a lot of music and music takes time. The quality of audio sent over by Chad was apparently shoddily slapped together. There are pops, clicks, loud noises, sudden rhythm pauses, and a whole bunch more that pretty much just disregards the basics of music fundamentals. So then Mick Gordon reached out to Marty Stratton and said, hey, this music doesn't look like it's up to par. I don't think the fans will be happy with this. But Marty Stratton would have none of it. And on the day the songs were due, Mick Gordon ran into some issues at the studio. He only had 10 songs to deliver instead of the 12 in the contract. Marty listened to nine of them and he said, yeah, these aren't gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, Marty decided to go with the backup plan of using Chad's song, and Mick made two more songs and sent it over. 
And that was it. Mick Gordon wished them luck and never heard anything after that. The soundtrack was released just two days later. After it was released, it was met with backlash and confusion because the quality was not up to the standard of Tomb 2016. There was even more confusion when this screenshot came out, and Mick Gordon said, Doubt will work together again in reference to working on music for another Doom game. People were confused. They knew something was definitely up. Marty and Mick began talking behind the scenes before this open letter was posted to try and figure out what exactly went wrong. Both of them frustrated, they agreed to do a Skype call to stand in solidarity and address the negative press together. But instead, Marty went to Reddit and more or less blamed Mick Gordon for everything. Following that, Mick Gordon finds out that id Software used more music than they paid him for. Mick alleges that some of the clips and mock-ups made were rejected, but they were in the final game. Now we're not talking about soundtrack music that he didn't get paid for, we're talking about in-game music. Now this is where we get into things that are only from Mick Gordon's side of the story. We can only assume that these legal negotiations were why Mick Gordon never actually responded to the open letter sooner than he did. After Mick Gordon found out about the open letter and the unpaid music, his lawyers got involved. And allegedly, Zenimax assumed that Marty had acted appropriately and denied needing to pay Mick Gordon for the music so at this point in time, it's Mick Gordon versus the Bethesda, Microsoft, Zenimax legal machine. And Mick Gordon just shoots back. He says, Marty's allegations directly contradicted contractual terms, public announcements, and contents of emails and phone calls. Mick Gordon has evidence, hard-coded evidence. Mick says, he exploited his position of authority to deliberately spread misinformation, used Reddit as a vehicle, and substantially damaged his reputation. And that Doom Eternal included almost five hours of music, over double what they agreed to pay per the contract. And after that, Zenimax offered to settle. But the deal to settle wasn't as cut and dry as you might think. This is where the silencing and manipulation starts. So Mick Gordon demands that Marty takes back his false accusations and issues an apology. But the Bethesda legal machine rejected that on Marty's concern that if he admitted fault publicly, it would negatively affect his reputation after he already did the same to Mick. So instead, they proposed a deal to Mick Gordon. They would give Mick Gordon the owed money for the music used that they didn't pay him for, but on the condition that Mick Gordon produce a brand new Doom Eternal soundtrack. Frustrated and feeling stiff-armed, Mick agrees to produce a new Doom Eternal soundtrack, but he was unwilling to do it as long as the Reddit post stayed up. But the lawyers, acting again on Marty's behalf, expressed worry that even removing the post would reflect poorly on his reputation. So. Bethesda came up with another settlement offer. The new settlement offer was a six-figure sum in return for taking full responsibility for the failure of the soundtrack. <sighs> and the details were absurd. Marty gets to keep the post on Reddit, the open letter, up indefinitely. He never has to retract his false accusations, nor clarify his statement, and his story would be forever considered the truth. And if Mick Gordon was ever asked about Doom Eternal or the soundtrack, he would legally be required to say no comment. Mick Gordon had to pledge he would never badmouth Marty or anyone working under Zenimax, and Mick Gordon could never criticize any product developed by a Zenimax studio. And in return, he gets a six-figure sum, and Marty would save face and be free to continue on his way without any fear of interference or any kind from Mick Gordon. So the terms of that are, are pretty stupid. I don't think anyone would agree to that unless you were in dire need for the money. But So wouldn't you know it, um, after that, neither party could agree. So Mick Gordon tried to get the Reddit post removed himself by contacting the moderators. And he arranged the meeting. And after the meeting with the moderator, it was removed, finally. But 12 hours later, it was back up again. And Mick Gordon received a letter from lawyers saying, removing that post has greatly offended Marty Stratton. And that's, that's when Mick Gordon finally posted his response. And then just after that, Bethesda came out with their response saying they're in full support of Marty Stratton and Mick Gordon's response had encouraged harassment of employees. But it's like, you let one of your employees do the same thing on Reddit via an open letter. Mick Gordon got death threats and stuff, and then he reveals what happens with evidence, and you're like, oh, look at us. Now, I know that was a lot of information, but stick with me. It gets worse. We're going to look at the direct lies and the evidence that Mick has to show that. But first, I need to show you this infamous Doom Eternal OST open letter. This is it right here. You can see it's posted by Marty at id. There were a lot of awards that were given to this guy and this post because of them being transparent with the community. That was the entire guys here. Marty was being transparent, but what he was really doing was covering his own by placing blame first and then using the legal machine to make it very, very difficult and uncomfortable for Mick to ever want to release what actually happened. Now, a lot of this is just kind of corporate fluff where you can kind of see right through it, but then he gets into the details, and that's what I'm going to show you where the lies and manipulation are. And don't forget, after this letter was posted, Mick Gordon's reputation 
was severely tarnished. Now, this is Mick Gordon's response. If you look up here in the top right corner, you can see just how tiny uh, this scroll bar is. So do I call it a response or is it more of a graduate thesis? But nevertheless, it is extremely detailed and you can tell his lawyers were sitting right behind him as he was writing this. Now, in an effort to make this easier for you, and for me, I've gone ahead and taken the liberty of combining these two responses together, shortening it down into my own Google document and highlighting where Marty Stratton says something incorrect and inserting Mick Gordon's response with evidence to show what actually happened. Marty says, at E3 last year, we announced the soundtrack would be included with the Doom Eternal's Collector's Edition version of the game. At that point in time, we didn't have Mick under contract for the soundtrack and because of ongoing issues receiving the music we needed for the game, we didn't want to add a distraction at the time. So let's talk about these ongoing issues. Now, when Mick Gordon signed on to do the music for the in-game part of Doom Eternal, they gave him a schedule that was pretty ridiculous. He had to do two levels per month. That's tight, but not impossible, he says. He says, whoever dreamt up that plan did so in isolation, though, because it quickly became apparent how disconnected it was from the game's development cycle, meaning it was going pretty slow. And one of the key features to Doom, if you've ever played it, was having music that closely matches the gameplay. So how can you make a finalized score for the game when pieces of the game are unfinished and still changing? So to have any hope of accomplishing his contract, he has to rely on id Software to provide materials illustrating the music's intended purpose. But difficulties emerged early on when they couldn't provide those materials in a timely manner. Two months into this contract, it's clear to Mick Gordon that this schedule is not going to work. He says it's a masterpiece in Excel, but a disaster in reality. The requirement to write, perform, record, mix, produce, master, and implement two levels of finished music with feedback rounds every 30 days when the levels themselves were bare-boned is ridiculous. Mick Gordon proposes an alternative plan, an alternative schedule. All the key dates stayed the same, but the immediate pressure of locking off two levels per month was eliminated, which had caused headaches already. Marty struck down Mick's plan. He rejected Mick's belief that the current schedule and logic of making finished music for unfinished levels was flawed. And he suggested my act of trying to do something about it was a sign of incompetence. Unsurprisingly, the game taking shape months later inevitably proved that guesswork compositions didn't fit. Weeks of work got thrown in the trash and calls for urgent rewrites amid milestones had already packed it tight. What frustrated Mick beyond belief was that he had flagged these exact issues as potential problems earlier in the project, but management seemed to forget that and instead blame the causes on me. Now remember, we're still only talking about Mick's involvement and experience with management so far with making the music just for the in-game part of it. Mick Gordon says he was cut out of music meetings, his emails went unanswered, and the mandated file transfer system auto-deleted all of the music files every two weeks. Its software withheld important information, and I was hardly able to ever check my in-game music. Now after this, Mick starts to talk about pay issues while he's working on music for the game. Again, not the soundtrack. These are all big issues that play a huge part of all of this incompetence going forward. Now, this is a screenshot of an email from Mick Gordon to Marty Stratton talking about how he was concerned with the timeline. It's obviously impossible for me to complete work on elements that haven't been completed. And I haven't been paid since December 2018 eight months ago. Mick Gordon is not an employee for this company, just a contractor, by the way. So that's how this works. He says, I've raised the issues multiple times and haven't gotten anywhere. Whilst I'm happy to crunch away in good faith, I'd certainly appreciate payment for the work completed so far. He then goes on to list an example where id Software rejected songs that he made for the game, but that they used in the announcement event for the game. Here's the actual announcement event with the game's music playing in the background. Yeah, they rejected that and then used it in a promotional video. Now, id Software denied paying him on the notion they changed their mind and no longer liked the music when he first submitted it to them. Mick Gordon argued the music appearing at a promotional event constituted usage, therefore they owed me compensation. In this case, they caved in and they paid him for it. So you can guess how it goes, right? He pulls up an issue. He's like, hey, I'm not getting paid. He has to pull out the law book and be like, hey, man, you used it. It constitutes usage. You should pay me. You can kind of guess how companies get after you do that to them. They're like, all right, we're, we're just going to be as difficult as possible. And that's what happened. They withheld approvals for his music and therefore payment for his music for months. Beginning in January 2019, he went 11 months without being paid. 
just because they kept rejecting his music. He says, I kept writing and writing, delivering sweet after sweet, working as hard as possible, yet management constantly painted my progress as a total failure and therefore an opportunity to chew me out with scorn and ridicule. They never wanted to discuss the circumstances like how a lack of materials was an issue. These individuals would seldom offer assistance or put forward any solutions. Instead, they just sullied the relationship with unnecessary layers of friction. Sounds like management to me. So that, all of that, those are the ongoing issues that Marty just casually glosses over in his Reddit post. It's basically a giant mess already. And what does id Software do? They announce a soundtrack with Mick Gordon's name attached to it without even telling him or giving him the contract. Now here's the problem. Pre-orders for that went on sale immediately. A severe issue because customers were putting down money for a collector's edition item that had no way of materializing because he had no contract. Mick Gordon says E3 events are planned out months in advance, well rehearsed and carefully managed, but nobody thought to discuss the soundtrack with me in any way whatsoever. I learned about the soundtrack in the media. For reasons I still don't understand, he flatly denied me the contract and refused to do anything about the soundtrack, saying he didn't want to cause a distraction. Nobody involved in the announcement seemed to consider consumer protection laws. Promising a product that wasn't in production put id Software and Bethesda at risk of violating those laws and oversight that would have severe consequences in the months ahead. In the following months, I continue to stress severe concerns regarding the apparent lack of any soundtrack strategy, but time and time again, he was either dismissed or outright ignored. Marty's position made no sense to me, and I determined that id Software was stretched thin by the overwhelming push to make the release date for just the game. But the beginning of January 2020 marked six months of pre-order sales for a game that wasn't finished, for a soundtrack that there was no contract for, and his demands for a contract became an arduous exercise in expressing myself to deaf ears. Pretty much says, as development wore on, tensions between id Software and Mick Gordon had been undeniably building from the beginning and only worsened as the cycle of music, avoiding approvals, and withholding pay continued. He even says he occasionally bore the brunt of some managers adopting Bethesda's legal history as clout to make lawsuit threats during arguments over demands. You can imagine being in the meeting room with all the managers and just trying to make changes or adjustments, and then management's like, well, you know, if you don't want to cooperate we have a history we have some friends the Zenimax legal machine you know finally he told them he couldn't continue working without pay he hadn't been paid anything in 10 months there was no more rewrites no more excuses no more discussions he had to be paid but according to them he was the one being difficult apparently the word they actually used is they called Mick Gordon a ball ache and they urged in no uncertain terms to carefully consider the destination his protesting would lead to but at the end of November, he was finally paid and he finished the music for the game. But now there's the looming threat of having the soundtrack set to release with the game. His name is on the soundtrack and he still doesn't have a contract. Now you might be wondering why Mick Gordon is so set on having a contract before he does any work. Back in 2015, Mick Gordon scored another Bethesda published game from a different studio. Shortly before the release, the team asked me to produce a standalone soundtrack album and wanted it ready for day one. The whole thing felt very last minute, but Mick Gordon agreed to do it. He says, I started working immediately, but they held up the contract saying their sluggish legal department was so behind schedule that the agreement wouldn't be ready until after I delivered. Have you ever heard that before? Oh, legal team, we can't get the paperwork right now, but go ahead, we got you. He says, that was far from ideal, but their assurances led me to trust the contract would come through after delivery. This is how you get burned. He says, that was my mistake. When handing over the finished album, the team abruptly told me they no longer planned to release it. And because he was under no contract, they owe him nothing. There was no use for it, and as such, they refused to pay for it. The contract never showed up. It was hard not to get mad, but upon reflection, I had to accept it was my fault for working without a signed deal in the first place. I learned a valuable lesson, don't ever work without a contract. But wait, but wait, 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 wait. It gets even better, I promise you. Four years later, in October 2019, Bethesda suddenly began selling the album that he made for them that they told him, we're not going to use it, we're not paying for it, sorry. He learned about the sales of that music through social media. So in the middle of all of this drama with Doom Eternal and the Doom Eternal soundtrack, he finds out that one of his music albums that he was never paid for is being sold. So Mick Gordon obviously sends a demand to id Software and Bethesda and says, hey, you got to pay me for this. They said, all right, we'll pay you when uh, the Doom Eternal soundtrack comes out and we'll just lump that money in together. Now, what if Mick had never found out about this? Would he have ever gotten paid for it? Who knows? Again, it's like you got to throw the book at him before they got to do the right thing. So now let's jump back to another one of Marty's inconsistencies. Marty says, after discussions with Mick in January of this year, we reached a general agreement on the terms for Mick to deliver the soundtrack by early March. But that's not true. Mick says, January was when I contacted Bethesda directly out of desperation as a last ditch effort to get around Marty's months of inaction. But up here in the open letter, Marty says, after discussions with Mick in January of this year, like you see how that's phrased, right? It makes it seem like 
there had been collaboration happening when there wasn't any. Artie didn't say, I, yeah, I, I was unresponsive for a while. I just didn't answer. And he went over my head to my boss. Mick says, I decided to circumvent the stone wall by going above Marty Stratton outside of id Software and directly to Bethesda to report my concerns and request a soundtrack contract. He said, I was worried that approaching Bethesda directly might ruffle some feathers, but I hope they would see the seriousness of the issue and that it needed to be acted upon immediately. I mean, it makes sense to me. I mean, what do you have left to do? If the person you go to isn't responding and your name is on something without a contract, like, what do you have left? So here's a screenshot of that email proving that Mick Gordon went above their head and straight to Bethesda. And once again, Marty Stratton up here talking about how after discussions with Mick, there was no discussions, bro. He says Bethesda quickly responded and they told him, we'll have something drawn up for you here shortly. Now let's look at some more manipulation. He says, the terms of the contract agreement with Mick were similar to the agreement on the first Doom in that it required him to deliver a minimum of 12 tracks, but added bonus payments for on-time delivery. The agreement also gives him complete creative control over what he delivers. Now this is a subtle thing that he adds here. Yes, he does have creative control over what he makes, but you have final say over what makes it into the game or into the soundtrack. So creative control to an extent. What this sentence does right here, I think to the public, most people read this and think, oh, he has complete creative control over what gets put into the soundtrack. Oh, of course. Yeah. No, that, that's not the case. On February 24th, Mick reached out to communicate that he and his team were fine with the terms of the agreement, but that there was a lot more work involved than anticipated, a lot of content to wade through, and that while he was making progress, it was taking longer than expected. He apologized and asked that ideally he'd be given an additional four weeks to get everything together. He offered that extra time would allow him to provide upwards of 30 tracks and a runtime for the soundtrack of over two hours, including all music from the game arranged in soundtrack format as he felt it would best represent the score in the best possible way. He says Mick's request was accommodated, allowing for an even longer extension of almost six weeks. So here's what actually happened. February 24th, that date is a complete lie. On March 7th, two weeks before the game's release, Bethesda sent him a draft contract for his review. So how could they have been okay with an agreement that didn't exist, Marty Stratton? He didn't have the contract then. In the contract, it stated Mick Gordon would produce 12 songs for the inclusion in the OST. All 12 songs were to be selected by id Software. id Software had final approval, and Mick Gordon was required to hand over all his source files, stems, raw assets, mix sessions, etc. The deadline was April 16th, but it was flexible, and they also assured me that the contract would include payment for the other soundtrack that they just started selling without telling him. So all of the delays that Marty is talking about Mick Gordon asking for, are because there was no contract. He says, before signing the agreement on March 18th, I could have simply walked away from the project and left them to deal with the fallout. And you should have done that, Mick. You should have walked away and just been like, yeah, I don't know, they put my name on it. I don't know what happened, I tried. Big Gordon says, Marty's false accusation that I forced him to delay the soundtrack has severely damaged my reputation, but it was Marty's active refusal to do anything sooner, which led to the delay. Once again, there are large pieces of information and events being omitted, most likely on purpose to leverage their side of the story more. Now, Marty says, it's important to note that at this point, we were also disappointed not to deliver the soundtrack with the launch of the game, but we had to be mindful of consumer protection laws in many countries that allow customers to demand a full refund for a product if a product's not delivered on or near its announced availability date. Even with that, the mid-April delivery would allow us to meet our commitments to customers while also allowing Mick the time he had ideally requested, but he didn't request any time. You literally just didn't give him the contract until the last minute, ruining this man's reputation. He says, as we hit the month of April, we grew increasingly concerned about the ability for Mick to deliver his soundtrack on time. I personally asked our lead designer, Chad, to begin working on id versions of tracks as a backup plan if Mick couldn't deliver on time. To complete this, Chad would need to take all of the music Mick had delivered for Doom Eternal the game, edit the game music together, and arrange those tracks into comprehensive soundtracks. In his open letter, posted on Reddit. Marty claimed that his decision to ask Chad happened at the last minute and was due to fears I wouldn't make the deadline of April 16th. But the files that Chad sent over to Mick Gordon told a completely different story. Perhaps unknown to Marty Stratton, the metadata of the files from Chad detailed the exact creation date, the time, the software, and whoever made the edits. The metadata and Chad's files showed that he began work on their alternative backup plan soundtrack as far back as August of 2019. That's six months before Mick Gordon even received a contract to work on it. So these people over here scheming behind the scenes and then they tell him, oh, I just asked him to do it. It's fine. See the sliminess, the scheming. Marty says, it's important to understand that there's a difference between music mix for the inclusion in the game and music mix for the soundtrack. He says, several people have noted this difference when looking at the waveforms. People went on Twitter and started posting waveforms saying, 
WTF. When a track looks bricked or like a bar where the extreme highs and lows of dynamic range are clipped, this is how we receive the music from Mick for inclusion in the game, in fragments pre-mixed and pre-compressed by him. Those music fragments he delivers then go into our system and are combined in real time as you play through the game. Then he says, alternatively, when mixing and mastering for a soundtrack, Mick starts with his source material, which we typically don't have access to. We know that's a lie because in the contract, he has to hand over everything he makes to id software. <laughs> And then he remixes the soundtrack to ensure the highs and lows are not clipped, as seen in his 12 tracks. So Marty blames the mixing problems for why the waveforms look weird, and essentially sidesteps the issue of how they were mixed being the problem. Now here's what actually happened. Mick says, I hope to use Chad's edits to expand the album beyond the limited 12 song contract, but unfortunately the content fell far short of expectations. It was a mess. He says the edits had been eyeballed in a slapdash way by copying audio files directly on top of each other without even a crossfade to cover the transition, resulting in clicks, pops, clipping, abrupt tempo changes, awkward gaps, and jarring transitions. Some songs were just seamless loop files ripped directly from the game's WI's package. In early April, April 3rd, 2020, I sent an email to Mick reiterating the importance of hitting his extended contractual due date and outlined in detail the reasons we needed to meet our commitments to our customers. Now let's look at what actually happened. On April 3rd, 13 days before the soundtrack deadline, he received an email from Marty Stratton. Marty's email stated, contrary to what Bethesda said about the April 16th date being flexible, it was now an absolute necessity. He said consumer protection laws in some territories meant anyone who purchased the collector's edition was entitled to a full refund if they didn't receive the soundtrack by April 20th. Mick said, it dawned on me that I was being threatened. Refunds meant financial losses. Marty was saying in his view, I was legally liable for any loss id software suffered due to customers claiming refunds over the late soundtrack. If it wasn't ready in 13 days, they would come after me. He says, I did the numbers in my head and the thought was terrifying. I couldn't understand why Marty hadn't told me sooner. If I had been made aware of the consumer protection issue before signing the contract, I would have refused to do the soundtrack. He says, the fact this critical piece of information had been withheld from me until after I'd signed the contract made the whole thing feel like a setup to shift liability caused by selling the soundtrack without a contract in the first place. It's pretty slimy. I have to say that that is pretty slimy. I mean, you're the musician. It's not your job to be in charge of consumer protection or anything like that. It's the company's job to handle that stuff. But now they've shifted it to Mick Gordon. So here's Marty's side of the story on the day it was due. On the day the music was due from Mick. He asked what he could expect from him. Mick Gordon said, I'm still finishing a number of things, but I'm going to give you 12 tracks. Mick Gordon informed us that he'd run into some issues with several tracks and that it would take additional time to finish, indicating that he understood we were in a tight position for launching and asked how we'd like to proceed. We asked him to deliver the tracks he'd completed and then follow up with the remaining tracks as soon as possible. Marty says, after listening to nine tracks he'd delivered, I wrote him that I didn't think those tracks would meet the expectations of Doom or Mick Gordon fans, and there was only one track with the type of heavy combat music people would expect. He says, I asked for a call to discuss. Instead, he replied that the additional tracks he was trying to deliver were in fact the combat tracks and that they are the most difficult to get right. He again suggested that if more heavy tracks are needed, Chad's tracks could be used to flesh it out further. Now here's what actually happened. The deadline for the soundtrack arrived, not the release date. The release date's two days after his deadline to submit his songs. And despite being worn down from the combined effects of overwork and lack of sleep, production had gone well. But on the final day, I encountered a system-related technical problem, and I contacted Bethesda to explain the situation. He says, I had 10 songs ready for handover, but a computer issue halted progress, and I needed some time to fix it. He says Bethesda was understanding and granted a minor extension. <sighs> and once again, wouldn't you know it, Marty's not happy. He demanded an urgent group call across three different time zones to tell everyone he didn't want these 10 songs. <laughs> you imagine? <laughs> Just working your ass off. He actually wanted other songs. I couldn't believe it. The deadline was five hours away. I had been awake for days after working for four solid weeks. Ten months had passed since the soundtrack first went up for pre-order. However, despite ample time, Marty hadn't given me any direction on the soundtrack whatsoever. But now, at the absolute last possible minute, he wanted to do something about it. I shot back that their rapidly crunching schedule and imminent deadline meant it was too late for a change in direction and that I'd prefer to use the little time remaining to work on the music rather than entertain this sudden last minute interest. Marty Stratton then goes on to say, Mick delivered his final two tracks, which we incorporated, and he wished us luck in wrapping it up. I thanked him and let him know that we'd be happy to deliver his final track as a bonus later on and reminded him of our plans for distribution of the soundtrack to the collector's edition owners and then later on other distribution platforms. Now, I think Mick Gordon's lawyers told him specifically to put this in his response. He says, I handed over my tracks. I wish them well. They approved everything. The contract amount, including the on-time bonus payment, was later paid out in full without dispute. Now we get 
to the part where they release and the backlash. So on April 19th, we released the OST to Collector's Edition owners. As mentioned earlier, soon after release, some of our fans noted and posted online the waveform difference between the tracks Mick had mixed from his source files and the tracks that Chad had edited from Mick's game music. Apparently, in a reply to one fan, Mick said this, I didn't mix those and wouldn't have done that. That and a couple of other simple messages distancing from the realities and truths I've just outlined has generated unnecessary speculation and judgment and led some to vilify and attack an ID employee. I assume we're talking about Chad, the guy that just cut up all the tracks and pasted it without transitions. So once again, Marty Stratton is just omitting huge events. Now Mick has shared with me that the attacks on Chad are distressing, but he's done nothing to change the conversation. So right here, Marty, I'm just going to go ahead and say I don't believe you anymore. I, <laughs> he's done nothing to change the conversation. All he's ever done is propose solutions. Marty says, after reaching out to Mick several times via email to understand what prompted his online post. Really? You're just going to play dumb, Marty Stratton? You're just going to play dumb? This is so... You see how he absolves himself from responsibility here? Whew. He says, we were able to talk. He shared several issues that I'd like to address. First, he said that he was surprised by the scope of what was released, the 59 tracks. Chad sent Mick everything more than a week before the final deadline, and I described to him our plan to combine the ID edited tracks with his own tracks, as he suggested doing. Once again, he's trying to be like, look, it was his idea. The tracks Mick delivered covered only a portion of the music in the game, so the only way to deliver a comprehensive soundtrack was to combine the tracks Mick delivered with the tracks ID had edited from the game music. So here's a subtle sleight of hand once again from Marty Stratton. He's just full of these. He's he's such a... Oh, man. It's so slimy, dude. So let me highlight where the contradictions and manipulations are happening. He says, So the only way to deliver a comprehensive OST was to combine tracks together to make more music. Now, we need to stop right here and talk about the contractual obligations, Marty. He was only contracted to make 12 tracks. The only reason it's not comprehensive and longer is because of your inability to give this man a contract to do the work. Okay? Mick Gordon completed his contractual obligations. He made the 12 songs, but you're making it sound like he couldn't make enough for us. No, he did. He finished the soundtrack up to the contractual agreement. This is just so slimy, the way he phrases these little things in this open letter. It took me so long to go through this, guys, and and, and point all these things out for you, but like, you need to know about this stuff. You, you have to see this shit in action. Corporate... <sighs> It's just, mm. He says, if Mick is dissatisfied with the content of his delivery, we would certainly entertain distributing additional tracks. You see how that's smarmy, smart ass. If he's dissatisfied, of course he is. And then right here, he makes a note about unpaid work, but he doesn't really admit to anything. I also know that Mick feels that some of the work included in the ID edited tracks was originally intended more as demos or mock-ups when originally sent. However, Chad only used music that was in-game or was part of a cinematic music construction kit. So he says... No, we're not, we're not using those mock-ups. No, we didn't. No, we didn't use anything that we rejected and said we wouldn't use. So between the time Mick hands over everything, washes his hands of it, and it coming out, he hasn't heard a single thing. He only hears the final product when it comes out. Mick's response is utter shock. Hearing the album for the first time, my heart sank. Alongside my direct contributions were an additional 47 tracks made by poorly editing together bits and pieces taken from my in-game score. They exhibited the same thoughtless disregard for basic music fundamentals that plagued the preliminary edits id software showed me a week earlier mick gordon was concerned that we'd given chad co-composer credit in which we did not do in the metadata mick is listed as the sole composer and the sole album artist on tracks edited by id chad is listed as a contributing artist here's mick gordon's thoughts on the credits seeing chad credited as a co-artist on these tracks pissed me off credit theft the act of taking credit for someone else's work is rampant in video game music chad didn't write arrange perform record or produce any of this music he carried out a copy paste job cutting apart finished music and resaving it for this the proper credit would be considered music editor not contributing artist yet in some cases such as erdak track 8 and track 15 he did nothing but change the file name <laughs> Changing the file name. Contributing artist. Dude, this company. He says, worst of all is the inclusion of hours of music and rejected demos I was not and still have not been paid to produce. Example, Final Sin, Sandy City, track 59, was a rough idea mocked up in haste for the ending cutscene. This exact demo file was immediately rejected. In fact, Chad was part of the panel that rejected it. My god. But he included the file on the album and listed himself as co-artist despite having absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> More importantly, the song is based on a melody written by Bobby Prince, the composer of Doom 2, who hasn't been credited anywhere. 
So here's the screenshot from Mick Gordon that shows the amount of unpaid music. This is what they owe Mick Gordon for. It wasn't until after Doom Eternal released that I became aware id Software had used nearly all of the music I produced throughout development, almost five hours worth while only paying for half of it. Isolated from the team working on the other side of the planet, I had no control over how they used the music. Music placement was the lead audio designer's responsibility, and after I handed the files over, they decided on how to use them. Using double what they paid for wasn't an accident. It was a conscious decision. Rejected tracks, mock-ups, demos, ideas, and sketches, and a massive amount of additional music well beyond the budget allocated in the contract produced at their request and shared in good faith. But id Software included it all directly in-game marketing and updates without paying for it. Even worse, id Software still refuses to pay for it despite the fact their contract guarantees payment for any additional minute requested beyond the original budget. So finally, after all this fallout is happening, people are noticing the waveforms going, what is this? And you're crediting this and Mick is being smarmy on the internet. What's going on, id Software? What is happening over at the, the team responsible for Doom Eternal and the soundtrack? Well, Mick Gordon and Marty Stratton finally hop on a Skype call. Mick Gordon says the soundtrack's problems were glaringly obvious and immediately drew negative criticism. He says, within hours of release, Marty emailed me. He was frustrated at my lack of public support and deeply concerned the soundtrack was attracting bad press. I don't understand how you're frustrated, Marty. Most of this is your doing. He insisted we urgently address the soundtrack situation publicly through a joint statement that affirmed our commitment to doing something about it. He asked for a call to discuss the matter. Mick Gordon was skeptical of his intentions. He says, I was worried he was setting up the call for confrontation, not resolution. He says, my responsibility to him ended when my contract finished, and I didn't feel like committing myself to a barrage of threats and abuse. In my view, the poor perception was the real-world consequences of a mismanaged product. I agree, Mick. Marty reassured me a positive outcome was his only focus. He insisted he had no intention of doing anything to disparage me or my work and only wanted to overcome the situation with a professional and collaborative approach. Uh, this sounds like bait to me, man. Mick says, after considering his demeanor, I felt I should embrace the opportunity to engage Marty directly and on the soundtrack and unpaid minutes because I also wanted a positive outcome to the situation. Marty reassured Mick and said that he genuinely wanted to work together. He wanted the best for all. So Mick had no reason to suspect anything other than positive intentions. So he took him up on the offer and got on the call. Mick Gordon says straight away on the call, it was clear Marty was angry with me. He says, frankly, we're too fucking nice. I could hear Marty making notes of my comments, but rather than acknowledge my concerns, he jumped to the conclusion that I was initiating an attack. Dude, this, this dude seems like a man child. He grew suspicious and convinced himself the act of me explaining the problems was some sort of diabolical scheme to sow disunity and division. <laughs> Mick Gordon says, after the call raged on for almost an hour, we ultimately agreed on the necessity to dispel rumors, calm fans, and demonstrate unity. I told him the situation felt like an excellent opportunity to show how disputes should be resolved. What a class act, man. What a class act. Just thrown under the bus, still wants to work it out, most likely wants to get paid for, <laughs> for his work. But still, like, that takes a certain type of person. Marty suggested we publish a joint statement that addressed the situation and detailed our plans to fix the album. I felt this was an excellent first step, but he requested that I hold off on all further public comments until we address the public together. I agreed to his request, and I said I was at his discretion. The call ended with Marty telling me to expect a draft the following morning. So I awaited the draft statement. It never arrived. <laughs> all of this takes place behind the scenes, and after the release of the soundtrack, they agree to get on a call, show some unity. Instead, in an ugly move, days later, Marty took to Reddit and used a company social media account to post an extensive series of lies that blamed me entirely for the failure of the Doom Eternal soundtrack. And then down here, you can see from Marty. If you've read all this, thank you for your time and attention. As for the immediate future, we at the we are at the point of moving on and won't be working with Mick on the DLC we currently have in production. Like, as if it's his fault that he doesn't want to work with you. I can't believe Marty Stratton s still has a job. Like, this just seems... It's so unacceptable. So after the open letter gets released, Mick gets his lawyers involved, obviously. Marty forwarded his complaints to Zenimax, and within days I got a response from the executive legal authority from the upper echelons of the company. Zenimax said, Marty had acted appropriately and denied needing to pay me for the additional music. Really? You're gonna side with Marty? To combat their stance, Mick Gordon showed that Marty's allegations directly contradicted his contract their public announcements, and Mick Gordon's emails and their phone calls. Mick Gordon also showed that he exploited his position of authority to deliberately spread misinformation, he used Reddit as a vehicle, and he substantially damaged Mick Gordon's reputation. He also showed that Doom Eternal included almost five hours of music over double what they agreed to pay per the contract. And once he presented those details, Zenimax is like, all right, 
All right, we'll settle. Let's settle. Settle, settle, settle. So Mick Gordon has some hope, and he's like, all right, Marty Stratton has to withdraw his false accusations and issue an apology. But they rejected that on Marty's concern that if he admitted fault publicly, that would negatively affect his reputation. Yep, that's right. Yep, you say some damaging stuff about someone, make all these lies and accusations, and then if you have to apologize, that shows, that shows fault. You can't be doing that. Like, lawyers, dude. Instead, they proposed a deal. They would pay me the money owed, but on the condition I produced a new soundtrack, appearing to suggest that if I gave them something to sell, that would somehow make up for the damage Marty had caused to my reputation. Mick Gordon went back and forth. He says, I struggled with Marty's insistence on avoiding accountability, but realized his company was unlikely to agree to anything unless it was mutually beneficial. And with that in mind, I agreed to produce a proper new Doom soundtrack. However, I was unwilling to do the work while living under the shadow of ridicule and abuse stemming from Marty's Reddit post. His actions severely eroded my trust in him, and I requested Marty take down the post as a sign of good faith. But once again, lawyers acting on Marty's behalf expressed worry that even removing the post, not even apologizing, just removing it, would reflect poorly on his reputation. So Mick said in response, I told him my acceptance of their settlement offer was tied to the condition that Marty would remove the post immediately. Mick Gordon says that prompted a spectacular meltdown. Their mood suddenly changed and a threatening tone edged their letter of response. They withdrew their settlement offer and vowed the Reddit post was just the beginning. Marty was willing to issue legal proceedings to use the court process to damage my reputation further. They threatened him over times he discussed Doom Eternal publicly, forcing him to remove his YouTube streams and for using Doom Eternal on his portfolio. That's right, Mick Gordon cannot share any of the music he produced for the game and had to remove any mention of Doom Eternal from his website. So this is Mick Gordon's portfolio site right now, and as you can see, the only mention of Doom is the original, Doom 2016. He had to remove anything that mentioned Doom Eternal. <laughs> that, that's just, that's just mean. That is just mean, Marty. Just take down the post, you little, you little baby. He says, the letter then devolved into a bizarre rant that attempted to frame Marty's behavior not as wrongdoing, but instead as something I deserved. But contrarily, that same letter presented me with a new settlement for damages caused anyway. Interesting. Mick Gordon says he was offered hush money to bury the issue. The new settlement was a six-figure sum in return for taking full public responsibility for the failure of the soundtrack, and the details were absurd. Marty would keep the Reddit post up indefinitely. He'd never retract his false accusations nor clarify his statement, and his story would be forever considered the truth. I could never discuss Doom Eternal, the soundtrack, or the Reddit post, and if I was ever asked about it, I would legally be required to say no comment. I had to pledge. I would never badmouth Marty or anyone working under the ZeniMax umbrella, and I could never criticize any product developed by a ZeniMax studio. I had to accept blame for the situation under contract for life. In return, I'd be paid a six-figure sum, and Marty would save face and be free to continue on his way without any fear of interference of any kind from me. Mick Gordon says, as far as I'm concerned, signing the gag order was out of the question. Giving up my right to tell the truth just to get some money was totally unacceptable. That's a, <laughs> that's a good man right there. That takes some character. It meant having Marty walk all over me wasn't so bad as to be beyond being paid off. So, Mick Gordon attempted to get the Reddit post removed himself. He contacted the moderators, he got on Discord, got on a call, got it removed, but then 12 hours later it was back up and Mick Gordon received a, another legal letter from Marty Stratton's lawyers saying, I didn't like that. That offended me. And this is where we have to assume um, Mick Gordon just was done with it. He's like, you know what? I'm tired of it. This is going nowhere. Here's what actually happened. This is Mick Gordon's closing statement. Marty Stratton has put me in a position where the only step I can take to repair my reputation is with a public response. It is a defense, not an attack published as a last resort. Marty seems to think so little of me that I'd give up my right to tell the truth and willingly accept the long-term mental health implications of publicly taking the blame for the situation in exchange for money. It's a slimy. I can't agree to protect him from the reality of what happened. The truth is more important, and signing a gag order would remove my ability to defend myself with the facts. The only thing left to do is this public response. On the screen now, you can see Bethesda's response. It says, The recent post by Mick Gordon both mischaracterized and misrepresented the team at id Software and the development of Doom Eternal. Marty Stratton and Chad Mossholder with a one-sided and unjust account of an irreparable professional relationship. I have to say, Bethesda, isn't that what you let Marty Stratton do on Reddit with his company account, with the open letter? Isn't that a one-sided, unjust account? It seems, to, it seems like it to me, but I'm a little hypocritical, Bethesda. We are aware of all the details and history in this matter and support Marty, Chad, and the team at id Software. We reject the distortion of the truth and selective presentation of incomplete facts. Isn't that what Marty Stratton did with the dates he used in the open letter? February 24th, January, like he never had a contract. This interesting. We stand ready with full and complete documented evidence to disclose in an appropriate venue as needed. Do it. <laughs> Do it then.
The statements posted online have incited harassment and threats of violence against Marty, Chad, and the id software team. I mean, that sucks. Don't do that. Don't harass people. Um... I mean, maybe you shouldn't treat people like trash. Okay. Any threats or harassment directed towards members of our teams will be met with swift and appropriate action to protect their health and safety. We remain incredibly proud of Id's previous collaborations with Mick Gordon and ask that fans refrain from reaching conclusions based on his account, and more importantly, from attacking any of the individuals mentioned on either side, including Marty, Chad, or Mick. Yeah, okay. Okay. Don't reach any conclusions based on his account. Read Marty's open Reddit post instead. Like, this is... This is trash. This is bad, Bethesda. You, come on, I thought you were better than this. Don't stand behind the corporate guy. But they gotta, they gotta protect their reputation, I guess, and let Mick Gordon flop around. I don't know. Mick Gordon, I hope you're doing alright. I haven't seen a lot of media from you um, since your post or this post, but I hope you're doing alright and you're not swamped in legal fees, and I hope you get what you deserve because you're a great artist and your music has, has really powered me through some tough times so now there are some little bonus clips i want to show you here i found a podcast of mick gordon i found a podcast where mick gordon is being interviewed after this open letter had been posted but before mick gordon released his response and in that you can kind of see mick gordon alluding to things that were happening in the background but now that we know what actually happened we can just assume that there was a large legal battle happening behind the scenes in which he doesn't say anything. In the podcast, he remains chipper, happy, and doesn't give away any discontent or difficulties working with the team. He just remains completely positive. And I have to say, it's just a class act. It really, really is. In fact, there's a clip in the podcast where he talks about his music being rejected and Siegel managers. Let me play that for you. Different people handle that pressure in different ways. Some mm. people are really great at sitting down and saying, I'm calm. I'm going to speak to you directly for two minutes. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to know, and then I'm going to go away because that's all you need. And th those people are great. That's brilliant. Other people come in and um, we describe them as like seagull managers, right? You know a seagull? Have you heard that term before? Seagull ma managers? Okay, so a seagull manager flies in, craps all over everything, makes a hell of a lot of noise, and then flies away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what the hell is this? This is crap. I don't want to do this. Why did everyone want this? This is all shit. This is all shit. This is all this shit. All right, go fix it. And you're like, Cool, what do I do with that, you know? So after watching that, I can only speculate if he was speaking directly about working with Marty Stratton because after seeing what happened, that's kind of what it seems like to me. But you know, we can't say, again, this is before he released his response, so we can just assume this huge legal battle just raging in the background, and here he is being positive and chipper and happy. And it's funny, in the podcast though, uh, when they do talk about crunch time, you can see him energetically, yes, Yes, there's tons of crunch. Mm-hmm, for sure. He never he never badmouths anything or anyone. Anyways, that's it for this video. It's long. It's the dark side of corporate, the subtle manipulation, the silencing, the gag orders, all of it. Uh Having said that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know. Leave a comment below. I know in the last video we said we're, we're trying to make more positive videos, but I said the roast will continue if companies truly screw over a worker, and I think that's this case. So, all right, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again. Happy holidays. I'll see you soon.